Alright. Hello, hello everyone and welcome to stream! How are we doing everybody? How is the vibe today? How are we, how are we faring? How are we, can we hear me? Okay, excellent. Hello everyone, welcome in, welcome to load. Excellent. <laughs> I opened up everything way too late. Hello everyone, welcome to stream, welcome, welcome in today. How are we doing? How is, how is everyone doing today? Amazing vibes, fantastic. I'm certain you can hear it in my voice. <laughs> of how, yeah, it's me again, unfortunately. Um, I'm certain you can hear it in my voice of how tired I am, but that's okay. It's okay. Today is not a roast stream. It is a crit stream. We are, we are critiquing work today. We are not trying to be angry. We are just trying to help. You sound like I went to a rock concert last night. No, I just taught two classes before this. <laughs> kind of tired of happy to be in the stream. Excellent. Excellent. Get well soon. I mean, I'm fine. <laughs> I'm just tired. That's all. Um, oh no. I mean, roasting and critiquing are different. Yes, Oz. Hello. Hello, everyone. Hello. Hello. All right. We all generally know how we go with these. We've got six people that I've chosen today. Um, I've got six people who I've chosen to um, crit their work today. I have pre-chosen the work from a submission period uh, that was given to me earlier. Um, so all of that is um, set up and ready to go. Each person will get about 20 minutes each for each of their pieces. Um, and I will do my best to crit your anatomy. I'll be critting a little bit more than just anatomy. Anatomy will be mostly what I'm focusing on, but I will give you some advice on other things as well. Um, so it's not just, uh, not just anatomy, but we can talk a bit about, um, other things as well. Um, but all right, before we get going, we generally know how these things go. Because if you didn't know, our growing community is filled with tons of art nerds and we art nerds have to stick together. So, if you're an art nerd too, be sure to check the links to our social media in the description below. And check out our website for our class offerings where you can get uh, critique, guidance, and encouragement from our instructors. Because we're not just a YouTube channel, we are an art school too. So if you'd like to support us, we can keep making free content. Consider supporting us by becoming a YouTube member for exclusive channel perks like emotes and sub badges. Or supporting us on Patreon for as little as $2 per month. Where you can get access to tons of perks like my working files, critique sessions, class recordings, and a huge discount on our classes that have a limited amount of spots. So be sure to check those out before they are gone. Yes, probably the most chill intro that I've ever done. <laughs> nice and nice and nice and low down to the ground. I sound a little channeling my inner Iggy for a moment. Hello, welcome in. Um, but yes, I wanna I wanna get started as quick as possible. You vibe with the chill. I also vibe with the chill. It's nice. It's the smoothest promo read yet. Thank you. Um. Rose said it so menacingly, did I? I apologize. Um, don't fall asleep on stream though, impossible. I've never done it before, I won't do it now. I mean, I'm the one who's, I'm the only one here, so I can't. <laughs> um, but all right, before I keep on talking a little bit too much, let's get into the actual meat of today. Um, let's get into the actual um, art that we'll be going through. Today we're gonna be starting with Amber Sky. We have actually gotten Amber Sky before. Um, You've seen Amber Sky's work here before, but uh, they submitted a, a good range of works. So I was like, you know what? Let's go for them again. Um, Amber Sky, thank you so much for submitting. She is Amber Sky underscore art on Twitter. Um, thank you for including that bit as well. Um, this piece, is Amber Sky uh, submitted backgrounds before this time they submitted people. Um, I mean, makes sense. Anatomy stream. Right. A couple things that we can mention uh, right off the bat. Um, oh, what was I gonna say? Right, the I'm personally a really big fan of your torso to uh, chest ratio. Um, in terms of just this whole upper section here, I'm very glad that it's not because you tend to have a slightly more I wouldn't say realistic but slightly more grounded approach uh, to drawing a person and I'm really glad that this isn't too exaggerated I'm really glad that the proportion of upper torso to legs is about the same about what you would expect um, for somebody who is drawn like this same thing with head measurement to the rest of the body when we have an adult woman we generally have about six and a half to seven heads throughout the entire body measuring that um throughout the entire form so just kind of you know visually looking at it seems about right 
Um, hi, Iggy. Welcome in. I'm, I'm channeling my inner you today. We're, we're, we're talking real chill today. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, we, I want to start off with the positives. This isn't a roast stream, so I'm not going hard in on anything. Um, we're just going to go straight into what I uh, want to say in terms of um, just giving crit, giving nice, um, not too rough um, crit and adjustments that I think could be made to everybody's pieces. I'm going to give you guys crit the same way that I give my students crit, um, which is a little bit different, a little less rough, a little less... Um, intensive. Um, the first thing I'm certain that everybody can kind of point out here is the chest. Um, the placement of this, of these um, forms on the chest, of, of the, the breasts, right, on a individual. This is such a huge gap, right? You're leaving such a huge wide root in the center of the body. And what's happening here is that the like clothing that you've put on this person doesn't really make a lot of sense uh i saw a pattern with a lot of your work which is where when you would draw um most likely a female figure what would happen is you would take that chest and you would have a perfectly fine rib cage shape you'd have a perfectly fine upper torso shape but then what you would do is you would kind of just draw them as two separate circles on either side and you would very you would carve them out of that upper torso by comparison to actually drawing them as if they were part of the body so uh, what i would notice is you would like one specific one one of your other pieces that you submitted you had like uh what was she wearing i think it was like a top kind of like this um in the arms at either side and then you carved out the breasts like this right i'm not sure if you have a chest like this <laughs> um i do <laughs> so i am i like to consider myself maybe not an expert but a highly experienced in the area if we are drawing anybody with breasts anybody with these kinds of forms on the chest we do not carve out these forms think about the forms, think about them as if they are just an extra form on the body, right? Think about if you've ever seen a woman in your life. I hope you have. Um, if you've ever seen a woman in your life, her chest is probably not carved out in this way on her body. What you will probably see instead is the fabric lying on top of it and still giving us the idea of the form of the chest but instead the fabric kind of flows off of it like this right gives us still that mounting form but the fabric will still flow off of the body even if it's tight right even a tight fitting fabric will still not carve out the chest like this you'll just see something more like that by comparison right we're not going to be showing us the entire you're not going to see there's a lot that's going to be left up to the imagination <laughs> when we are having, when we have somebody who is clothed, right? And we are putting fabric over top of them. So let the fabric loosely fall over that body. Don't carve them out. We don't want to see that they have dinner plates on their body. They have breasts, right? Very different, very, very different approach to drawing the chest, right? You've also drawn them quite far apart here. So let's analyze the structure of this body. Isn't this nice, everyone? This is so chill. By comparison to the rose streams where I'm so angry. <laughs> we have our rib cage opening. You have a bit of that showing through here. Very nice. Really, you would only have a line this harsh as well. I know you've drawn this here um, as like the opening um, between the rib cage and the stomach area, which does not have any, um, well, it has muscle. Like you have your abdomen muscle, but it opens up away from bone. Um, you would really only have that harsh of a line if this person was incredibly thin. Um, so this person seems to be about a healthy weight, so you really wouldn't show this arch here either um, because that will be covered up by muscle and fat. So let's analyze the structure here, right? We have our hips here. Just judging on based on this, this is approximately where I expect the legs to go. So this thigh is actually traveling a little bit strange here. You'd probably have it 
exit out like that. Crotch area. And we want our thighs to be approximately the same length because there is no perspective applied. The knees would probably end right here. Actually, no, a little bit more like here. Yeah. All right, so this knee's a little bit low. I know that you tried to have them there, but we want to make sure that we are looking at the angle of the hips not the angle of the legs themselves. So think about that attachment point, even though you have things covering her right here, right? We still wanna make sure that we are taking note of where everything attaches on the body. This is why it's very, very important. Uh, everybody take note of this. When you are illustrating a person, even if parts of their body are covered or cut off by the composition, you wanna draw them in their entirety anyway. So I gave this a piece of advice to my brother a long time ago. If you, have like, let's say, I think he was doing a piece that was like this. If you have like a person, um, like top down, right? Let's say that the composition is like this, right? And you have like one hand, like behind the arm here or behind the head here, the shoulder, and then part of the arm gets cut off like this. You don't want to try and draw around the edge. No, no, no. You want to just draw the entire form of the arm, even if it gets cut off by the composition. This way, you have your correct proportions in mind when illustrating. Same goes for if it's covered by clothes or if it's covered by an object or whatever. You still want to draw the entire body because if you don't, then your proportions will be wacky, right? So now, if I just erase things that are not in the composition, this still feels correct, right? So even if we don't get to see these portions, it is still important to draw in all of it so that everything still feels proportional with the entire body, right? So the thing I was gonna analyze with this, right? We have our chest here. Right, look how far away you're drawing the breasts from each other on this chest. Extremely, extremely far, right? We don't want to think about that. Our pectoral muscles are pretty close together. They don't perfectly touch. They do kind of this magic because of our sternum directly in the center, but they are much closer than the way that you have drawn them. And our, our breast tissue, uh, which is generally fat, um, will lie pretty much directly on top of those. Sometimes roots are wider, sometimes roots are thinner. So the um, space between your chest will change um, depending on the person. So really, sometimes they're very close together. Sometimes they're very far apart, but they are definitely closer than this. So you'll probably have the breasts more like that by comparison. If they are a little bit wider rooted or sorry, thinner rooted, they're chest is probably going to be closer like that by comparison, right? A little bit closer together if you wanted to keep them slightly larger, they would be closer together on that body by comparison, right? If I get away that, get rid of that, right? You see, much closer together at a more realistic distance apart from one another. Now, Another really big thing, Iggy's already pointed it out, but another really big thing is that, yes, if there is enough fat on this person, then yeah, you're going to have a little bit of a crease right here, especially if that person's got a little bit more of a thicker midsection, then yeah, there's going to be a little bit of a crease on here. It does depend on the person, though. If they are thin enough, uh, there won't be a crease there, actually. Um, it'll, be, it'll be quite smooth, quite curved. But I think my main point um, when I look at this pose is that it's very, very stiff. You have a bit of a stiff pose going on. So what I assume you did is you kind of just straight through drew the entire pose, drew one leg at a time, drew one arm at a time, um, and kind of just uh, drew each body piece by piece by piece. Now people will hear me and they'll go like, Jesse, isn't that how you draw? Not necessarily. When you are illustrating a piece with a lot of movement, you may do a lot better by illustrating it all as if it is one big form. What do I mean by that? Now that is a little bit of a more complicated, um, a, a bit of a more complicated, uh, oh, what do you call it? Principle to think of, but it really helps if, let's say we start with the head. Generally we start with the head um, with 
uh, character illustration because we measure the body with heads. Um, as you get a little more advanced with me, my gesture drawings I actually start with the torso, um, but it depends on the person, depends on how you are approaching. But especially because this is a water character, we can really, you know, emphasize that flow, emphasize that movement of this individual, right? What's going on with the original pose is we have this kind of arc happening here, but then there's a competing arc with the tail, and then we have another competing arc with this leg here, where the perspective is quite off on this calf. Um, and then we have, like, uh, more competing things with, like, the... Actually, the arm is fine, but I'd say, like, the, the hair could have been arced a little bit better, right? We want to capture that movement within our our forms. This is the point where we release a bit of that anatomical knowledge and we go more into gesture to really get that movement into the pose. So let me redo this pose really quickly. Let me do my fun little trick where I go window, arrange, new window, so you can still see Amber's work. There we go. Now if I was to kind of redo this pose a little bit, right? If we want to keep this nice flowing movement from one side to the other, we can keep that in this new version of the pose. Let's say we do one big kind of arcing movement. We call this our line of action. Most people will say that your line of action has to be a C or has to be an S. I disagree. The, your line of action can also be the letter C, in my opinion, an arc. You can have our upper torso here. But let's just keep that movement going. Don't slow down. Keep that arc of one leg going. Don't slow down at all. And again, we want to draw the entire body no matter what it is covered by. We want to draw that body first. So we have one toe. We can have this pointed so that it keeps that flow up. If we wanted to have this leg be a little bit bent, there's going to be some foreshortening here. And some foreshortening back here. Complicated, but it could be good. And we can have this foot. You could have it pointed this way. It feels a little unnatural. You might just want it po pointed like this instead. And to keep up that movement, right? We have this perfect C arc. Well, not perfect, but we have this C arc going, right? We've got this C arc going with the entire body. Let's keep it up, right? Arm. This arm good job you can curve it upwards but keep it as a curve right now you have really put in those muscles right great but we can really exaggerate this curve of the body by keeping that curve there and keep this your elbow will be above the head or a line up just about right with the head i'm gonna have one hand here you can keep this arm here, sure. I would actually maybe push it a little bit closer to the side of the body like this, so that we keep this kind of general form going. And then the tail, right? You had your tail like this initially. This competes with the initial movement of the body. So let's keep the tail like this instead and help it swish through the entire movement of the body. And this really helps emphasize that movement that you've got going. Same thing with the hair. We can have the hair pushed down this way now, right? And now everything feels like it is flowing in a direction. It feels like everything is kind of moving in that direction you were hoping for, right? And that gives that nice flow, that nice push upwards um, into your pose, right? Just some general little things, right? And where one side extends like this, the other side will crunch in, right? You've kind of got a triangle going here now, right? So if we have one curve, if we are doing a C curve, right? Think of a person who's doing stretches on one side, right? If we've got one person stretching over like this, the other side of them is crunching inwards, right? So one side left really open, the other side will be crunching inwards. So you got to make sure that you have that, those opposing, opposing energies within this pose. Okay. So hopefully that's a little bit more helpful. Some general anatomy tips and general movement tips, squash and stretch. Yes. Yes. Very, very animator-esque. <laughs> You see this? This is nice. This is a nice, very calming. This is how I give my, 
if you ever wanted to know what it's actually like in my classes, what kind of crit I give my students and how I go about it, this is closer to what it's actually like in like my mentorship classes and my digital art classes. So if you would, if you actually want to know how I crit, this is about it. Um, Maybe elaborate on counter shape, like instead of a C curve for the tail, make it count of a line of action for a dynamic pose instead of a flowy one. For sure, you can definitely do that. But it's a different way that you could approach. What they are saying about counter shape is just countering and changing that um, that line of action from a C to an S. Now, that is completely changing the pose altogether because you are then creating a twist in the body, which is going to be a little bit different, a little bit more difficult. Um, I tried to keep the integrity of the original pose but if you wanted to counter shape it that's completely fine as well so then instead of just a c you would do this thing you'd move it like this and me personally to match that sort of curve of the body i would rotate the upper torso so it is facing downwards instead so you've got a bit more of that natural spinal curve as it curves downwards like this and the tail can do that sort of magic as well. Finding that movement in the pose, you can also really accentuate it by, by knowing your anatomy, knowing how different parts of your body curve, right? So if you were to counter pose this pose, it is going to be a little bit awkward because then you're going to be bending your legs this way and that feels a bit strange, right? So intelligently pick where you're going to be changing your pose intelligently pick how you are going to be posing your figures um so that you can get a nice flow of movement no matter what kind of pose you're going for there's going to be a flow of movement that you're going to want to capture so um anatomically there are parts of our bodies that curve there are parts of our bodies that change and that curve in a more natural position so our spine right our we have our, oh my god, our thoracic spine, which is the one across the rib cage, which forms the upper part of the S, and then our lumbar, which is our lower part of our S that makes up our spine on our backs. So following that curve within your, um, within your line of action, within your movement, um, will make your poses much more interesting, much more, much more flowy, much more fun. Sure, you can go against the grain, absolutely, um, but that's a little bit more complex. So, all right. <laughs> Hello, Naomi. You want to know what's like in Jessie's class? She's, she's scary. <laughs> Hi, Naomi. You should come back someday. These classes are super fun. I'm glad, I'm glad. Starting the full anatomy. If you're doing a busy or crowded scene where forms overlap, would you start in any particular order, like front to back? Yes. I would start... Um, actually, it depends. I would start with my focal point first, um, and then fill in the rest. So it really doesn't matter where you start. I tend to actually start from front to back, um, but it really doesn't matter too much. Um, but overall, you want to start with your focal point so that you know you're giving it the most attention, um, and then move on from there. What time is it for me? Almost 3.30. Uh, but it's 3.23. So on that note, then, we are going to move on. Thank you so much, Amber, for submitting. Uh, lovely work. Lovely, lovely stuff. Just really focus on your anatomy. Make sure you're using tons of references. Um, and really start with these basic forms first before you move on to something a little bit more complicated. All right. Next up, we've got Clover. Clover, who submitted um, their work to me. No social media. Completely fine. Um... Clover seems like a little bit more of a beginner, but that's completely fine. Um, we all start somewhere, and I think it's important to note that we all do start somewhere. Clover's got a bit of an action shot going on here with um, what they're working with. And I think um, just with a lot of what I'm looking at, especially with younger artists, with beginner artists, I actually didn't take a look at how old they are. Um, but with, with young, with uh, less experienced artists, we always do this sort of straight ahead way of illustrating. Um, not really thinking, just kind of going, okay, this is a pose that I would like to do. I'm going to do it. Um, artists in chat. Hi, Clover. Hello. Welcome in. Thank you. Thank you for submitting. It is this sort of straight ahead way or actually no that's not how you work how you work is you saw 
the shapes, the forms that I use to draw my, my people, or you saw the forms that other people use. And what you've done is you haven't quite understand, you do, haven't quite understood how these shapes are supposed to work with each other. So if I had to guess, you probably started with some sort of trapezoid here. And then you went, okay, well, I know that a lot of people draw circles for their shoulders. So I'm going to do that too. And you saw a bunch of rectangles and you're going to attach those as well. Right? Very interesting. Very, very much of the way that younger or more uh, beginner-esque artists would work, right? However, when we are working anatomically, when we are working with these forms, the things that we need to understand is that these are not shapes on our body. They are forms, they are muscle, they are muscle and bone. And the number one thing with muscle is that muscle interlocks um, on our body. If you've never seen how the deltoid, pectoral, and the trapezius interlock on the body, let's take a look at that. If you don't know any of those names, don't worry. I'm going to tell you. So our deltoid is our shoulder. If you want to just touch that squishy part on the upper part of your shoulder, that is your deltoid. Your deltoid muscle is right here. Your trapezius is the big, like, kind of diamond-shaped muscle that comes actually onto your shoulders. It's like you're wearing a backpack. So our trapezius kind of ends right here. And our pectorals are our chest muscles. And our chest muscles are on our chest. We know where that is. And if you've never seen how they interlock, you have the trapezius in between your shoulder and your neck, right here. Oh, is music okay, by the way? I forgot to ask. Is it too loud? Is it too quiet? Let me know how it goes. We have our trapezius that kind of arcs over into here. Our deltoid snipe, like, kind of intersect. Music's good? All right. Our deltoid kind of intersects with our pectoral and our trapezius and our pectoral sort of overlaps the deltoid once more right and they kind of all interlock and work with each other right same deal with like this is only these muscles right another a big point of reference that people have when drawing the um oh my god uh the bicep and the triceps right and there's all of these general arm muscles in overall is that we think of them like chain links and that is exactly how arm muscles slot into each other right isn't that fascinating we even have a muscle on the side of our body right here called the serratus anterior and these are quite literally muscles that serrate on the sides of our body so if you've ever seen people really muscular people who have these kind of serrated forms right here that is called the serratus anterior so what does this have to do with this individual's artwork with clover's artwork now the reason why i say all of this is because what you have done is you have drawn as if you are thinking of these as shapes not necessarily as if they are muscle right when we raise our arms when we have an arm raised this muscle here our trapezius squishes it pushes inwards same thing with our deltoid it pushes inwards raise your arms for me raise them up high into the sky if, you, if, if anybody wants to follow along, if you want to raise your arms up, you notice that your shoulders go with you, right? And that if you want to place a, a hand between your neck and your shoulder, you feel that piece of your trapezius kind of squishing inwards, right? And you feel it flexing. You feel those different parts of your arm flexing if you raise your arm up and down. And you feel between your neck and your shoulder, right? It isn't just a straight plane there. This is muscle that moves and raises and lowers. So when we have an arm that is raised, our shoulder will automatically be pressed closer into the face. Our deltoid raises up. We can see those armpit muscles instead. Our trapezius is squished and our pectoral muscle is also brought upwards. While the other if we were to leave it down, we still kind of get that muscle structure right there. Right? Everything squishes. It squeezes when we get, when we raise our arms up. <laughs> Let's send her our energy. Send me your energy. Uh, I need it to defeat. Oh, what's his name? I forget his name. The purple guy. I'm so sorry. I The only knowledge I know about Dragon Ball is uh, watching my, my partner play Dragon Ball Z Kakarot <laughs> at like 3am. Um, 
But yes, so we want to make sure that we are still understanding how that shoulder raises. And arms above the head um, seems like a complicated um, place to follow anatomy because you're like, oh my god, it's so far away from my torso. What do I do? Not to worry. Your elbow actually aligns with the top of your head. So if we were to kind of fix this a little bit, we're going to raise that arm up, have our deltoid there, squish in our trapezius, and our elbow is going to end right here instead. If we have this arm kind of crossing over here, no worries at all. Your forearm should be about the same length as your upper arm. So we want to make that much, much longer by comparison. I did not mean Grimace. <laughs> What's his name? The, the, oh no, the purple guy from, from Dragon Ball. Oh no, it's his name. I... Uh, and they fought on, an, on another planet, and it was like a whole big thing. Frieza! Thank you! <laughs> it's Frieza! <laughs> no, not Majin Buu. Majin Buu is pink. I hate Majin Buu so much. Um, <laughs> William Afton. The movie was, like, cute, I will say. Um, but yes, arm up, raise, just like that. Now, you have a bit of a complicated pose when it comes to your hands as well. You've chosen quite the complicated way to display your hands. Now, what I want everyone to do for me really quickly is I want you to try and copy this pose. Now, it's, it won't hurt. This is actually completely fine. Put one arm above your head as if you're holding a sword. Put another arm right in front of you as if you're holding a sword straight up. Doesn't hurt. Completely fine. You can actually do this pose completely fine. So well done on that. However, look at how you've drawn your hands and hold your hands the same way, right? You probably have, with your arm over your head, you probably have knuckles facing forwards. And when you have your hand right in front of your chest, you have thumb facing inwards, knuckles facing to the side. Right? Not too bad. I'm... So, the best thing is when you keep your... Well, don't, don't try to copy the hands. <laughs> I'm talking about how the hands are wrong, but just the arms right? Just the arms, where the arms are positioned. One right in front of you, one over your head. Not too bad at all, right? As if you're doing the tango. <laughs> As if you're about to do the tango, right? You have one hand, head behind above your head, one right in front of your chest, right? So the one that's right kind of in front of your stomach, right below your chest, um, that one you feel, you can see that your thumb is facing inwards, your knuckles are facing over to the side. So let's fix that right here, right? We've got our hand facing towards us. Let's fix this arm up a little bit, give him a little bit more definition. We don't want to just give this for individual sticks. And then we have the other arm up, um, like up here. It is our pinky finger that faces outwards. Oh, this is a complicated one, actually. It's our pinky finger that faces outwards, so you'll get something like that. A bit complicated, because you're going to have your sword, your machete here be foreshortened and that's quite complicated but this one's not too bad it's right in front of you just like that right if you are ever unsure if you are ever unsure of where your fingers go if you're ever unsure of what position your hands should be in do the pose yourself right you can look up references as much as you'd like, but doing the pose yourself will help infinitely, right? Doing the pose yourself, making sure that you are getting those fingers in the right position, right? Helps a ton. <laughs> when I first started drawing humans, I overestimated anatomy. Nah, brother, I didn't sign up for this when I was learning kitty cat anatomy. It was simple. My ADHD can comprehend. Uh, <laughs> oh, it's not too bad. This is, it's, it's stuff that you gain over, like, I'm, I've been drawing my entire life, right? It's something that you gain over time. It's not something that you have immediately, right? Keep practicing. Keep doing what you're doing. Eventually, it'll make sense. The anatomy has hand. If your anatomy has hands, everybody calm down. Everybody calm down in the comments. I can see you. You're misbehaving. I will kick you out. So, make sure that you are kind of focusing. Make sure that you are, you know, focusing on your anatomy, your proportions. I just taught my students about proportion, right? Make sure you're focusing on what positions your hands are going in. Make sure you're focusing on, um, focusing on where things are going. Now. 
like I mentioned in the previous one, we've got our upper torso here. We lower this down. Notice where our the bottom of our pelvis actually ends, right? His legs are a little bit short, so let's lengthen those a little bit. Make sure that we're not just drawing sticks for our bodies, right? You clearly are a bit of a of a, a slightly a slightly more more of a beginner with your illustration, and that's completely fine. So let's talk about very generally how to get these forms of the legs nice and quick. And I'll tell you about where these kinds of muscles are placed. If we have our thigh muscles here, right? Our thigh, you can kind of generally draw it like this, right? You've got a couple of muscles going like that, opening up to our patella. Our patella is not actually this large. Um, I personally like to draw it as a bit of a coffin shape because it helps lead into our calves. But our calves... If this is the inner side of the body, right, if we're, if I kind of give you that sort of underwear shape, this is the uh, medial side of the body. Your muscle down here will be lower, kind of coming from that sort of patellar bone. And the outer muscle will be a little bit higher. Like this. It's almost like another coffin shape, but the edges of the coffin are off kilter if I was to break it down into a really, really simple geometric shape for you, right? Nice and simple. So, so many coffins. <laughs> this looks quite complicated, but it's really not. If we break it down into some nice and easy shapes to go by, you can think of this as like kind of a long trapezoid and sort of this coffin shape going on here. And then an off kilter sort of maybe baseball bat coffin shape and you're good to go. The foot, really simple forms as well. Circle, trapezoid, triangle, semicircle. Let me say that again, it is a circle trapezoid triangle and a semicircle and what's really fun about using these shapes is that you can draw them in any angle and you will get the foot you can draw them in any order in any placement and you will get the foot in quite literally any pose that you could ever dream of right so if i want to draw this from the back just trace these shapes you got to think of them as forms though a little bit more complicated, but get you started on this. Makes it a little bit easier. And ta-da! You've got the foot in every different angle. Alright. Well, Willow, if you keep on acting like that, then I will have to ban you from the stream. Apologies. Sorry about that foot thing. I've never worked for it. It's a cry every time I draw one. It takes a while. It takes a while to get used to it. Um, there's also the form version, which is the pudding cup. And then you have a bit of a door wedge thing going on. And then I semicircle. But yeah, lots of different ways that you can draw feet. Lots of ways you can simplify. Um... And then I guess last maybe couple of minutes here, I'll just tell you a little bit about the anatomy of the head. I can see where you drew this circle. I can see you did the ball and shield method right here. A really big thing when it comes to drawing hair. Hair, you never want to draw along directly along this circle here. Hair has volume, so you're going to want to push that up a little bit more right, to give it more of that volume. If you have a part, then make sure you are sticking by that part. Our ears are always going to be between top of the eye, bottom of the nose. Let's make sure we remember that as well. And then when we are drawing heads, we have measurements that we can use to draw the face. So if we draw a line straight down the face, we can do, so we cut this in half. We have half and half. 
halfway down the face. This is our eye line. Make sure that our eyes are the same height, no matter what. Halfway through this section, so about a quarter. We've got the bottom of the nose. And then about an eighth through, so another half. You've got the bottom of the mouth. Of course, this can be pushed around. It can be changed a little bit, give or take. But this is about what you want when you are measuring the face. These are the kind of basic measurements of the face that you can abide by um, when you are drawing anybody. Of course, again, you can push and pull it. You can add some differences for, you know visual interest or for design interest, but overall, generally what you want to stick by. Half a quarter and eighth, easy to remember. Yeah, it's very easy to remember. It's very good. But all right, how often do you flip your canvas? Every like three seconds. <laughs> um, I am just critting work right now, so I'm not really flipping the canvas at all, um, but you know, it. I flip my canvas like like every five seconds. <laughs> it's it's like habit. Um. But all right, Clover. Thank you so so much for submitting. Artists and chat. Everybody say thank you. They did a great job. Um, and they are very brave <laughs> to have submitted their work and let me credit on stream. Uh, for uh a few hundred people to see. So, thank you all. So thank you for submitting, Clover. Um. And I hope this was helpful in some way. <laughs> All right, moving on to the next individual, we have Marissa. Marissa is an incredible artist. Um, fantastic use of color, amazing use of line work. Um, I didn't only want to grab beginners in here, I wanted to grab people who are a bit more intermediate as well, who are a bit more, a bit more advanced in their work. There's a couple of more advanced people in here, I believe. Um, but this is a beautiful piece. I um, was especially a huge fan of your Samus one. Well done. Um, and this is a really, really fun one where I get to look at it and I can talk about some slightly more advanced things, um, stylistic things, um, as well as go into what you were hoping to get into, uh, which is um, worrying about muscle structure and worrying about um, how they sort of serrate into each other. I was like, because I saw these and I was like... I'm like, I don't know what you want me to do. <laughs> You're a really, really good artist. Um, but yeah, amazing, amazing work. Uh, well done, Marissa. Uh, her handle is Digital Hollow on Twiddle. On Twitter. Twiddle? Twitter. <laughs> Digital Hollow on Twitter. Um, and this is what she has submitted for us today. It was tough to pick one. Um, there was those three uh, that she submitted. Um, again, my favorite was the same as one. Well done. Um... Oh, where do I start? This is this is a tougher one because this is again this is a this is a really really good one. Um, okay, I think the main thing that I would point out, um, the main thing that I would point out with this is that you've got a really good silhouette going on up here. Let me let me change the size of my brush. You've got a really good silhouette going on up here. The hand is so clear. Um, you've got this whole arm going on up here. Super, super clear. Head nice and clear. Arm back here. Super, super clear. And this leg is pretty clear. But this one kind of gets lost, right? And it creates a bit of a strange... A bit of a strange silhouette. Um, if I was to fill this all in, right? Silhouette is a really big thing that more advanced artists might want to consider. Um, of course, you should consider it all the time, um, but it is a concept that I think makes more sense the better at art you get. So let me fill in this silhouette really quickly. Now, without seeing any of the inner details, right? Without seeing any of the inner details of this upper section 
very easy to tell what's going on. One arm pushing forward, one arm in the back over here. These legs, however, are all getting a little bit lost. I can see one leg, but I couldn't, I wouldn't be able to tell what this is right here, right? This is a bit of a clumpy section right here, right? How would you fix this? Bit tough, bit of a tougher one to deal with. So let's talk about it a little bit. Now, I understand what you are going for and I understand what you need to do, um, especially when it comes to poses that are much more action oriented. Um, you want that counterbalance to feel the, the strength in this pose, right? So their pose, they have, if I was to draw this kind of from the side, you've got one arm punching like this. The other arm is reeled back like this. This arm is too small, um, but we've got kind of one arm punching like this, another one reeled back like that. And then we have the whole body twisting. And the opposite leg is pushing forwards while the other leg is pushing back. And what this does is it creates sort of a counterbalance that gives this punch power. Twists in the body are how we give our poses power. It's how we give our, our poses and movement strength, right? And with the extreme twist that we've got going on here in this front of the body, you've definitely got like a ton of exaggerated power going into this hand here, right? Unfortunately, it is making the silhouette a little bit weaker though. So how can we fix this? Now, all we really got to do in my opinion is just kind of shift where we are showing these two legs. So if we have our upper torso right here, we can still have this bend, right? But instead of him just kind of taking a knee, we could have him lunging forward instead. So what if we had this leg pushing like this? And we have a bit of foreshortening right here. You have no problem with foreshortening. So if we have this leg like this, and then this one pushing back like this instead. So it's almost like he's jumping forwards by comparison to taking a lunge. And this will also help empower that movement and also really accentuate those leading lines going towards this hand, right? Thank you, Evie. Because what this leg is doing is actually sort of taking away from that movement by creating an almost stopper for the pose itself, right? By pushing this forward, we could even have this leg like really, if you really want to twist this, you could have this leg like really pushing like that. It's a bit of a, a bit of a dancey pose, but that's okay. It's like you could have this leg like full thigh facing us and the calf back here. And then we have the other leg sort of flying back here. So it's almost like he's like really kind of moving towards us. It's not, it's not, this isn't the, the best <laughs> way to illustrate this, but I hope you know what I mean. Um, to kind of just have these two legs just be a little bit more clear in the silhouette. Um, another thing that I've kind of noticed immediately is how your torso is connecting with your lower body here. And I know that that's something that you said you struggled with a little bit is getting these muscles to fit in together. Let me go over this for you. What you have done here, right? You've created this lovely, well, this should be saved, yes. Um, I also saw somebody um, ask how to submit work. I have chosen all of the work ahead of time. So there is no more exception. There are no more works being accepted at this time. So what you have here is this lovely twist of the upper torso going into your pelvic area, your pelvic region. So let me draw these out as if they are bones first. So what we've got, this is why it's also very important to find the center of our body. If this is between right here, the pectorals, we have our sternum right here. Our spine would sort of 
curve around like this. This is our hip dips and this is our iliac crests right here. And the front of our pelvis is right here. We've got an insane twist going from up here all the way down here. We've got an insane twist in the body going on. Very exaggerated, very, very cartoony, um, but it really does help with that sort of um, power and that sort of like exaggerated like falcon punch that's going on right here. Um, however, even though you have technically twisted these parts of the body, what you have failed to do is you have not adjusted the muscles as if they are twisting. So what's going on right here is what you have done is you have treated it as if it is almost like a like a salt and pepper shaker, if you know what I mean. So it's like if you have the like if you have like a salt and pepper shaker and you have like the top of the or grinder, sorry, like a pepper grinder. If you have like the top here and you twist it, right? And the top twists on its own and the bottom stays the same, right? That's kind of how you're approaching this. So you have your upper torso that is facing this way, right? You've got your pectoral muscles here and your abdomen muscles here and all of your abdomen muscles are facing this way. However, it's almost as if there's a line here that's cut off and now your pelvis is right here and the center of the pelvis is right there, right? You're treating it like a pepper grinder. So what you want to do instead is follow that twist of the body that you have created. So if you have your pectorals right here, your abdomen muscles are also going to twist to match that movement of the body that you have presented, right? Think of it as if you have like a piece of tape, right? You put one finger you put one side of the tape on one piece of one finger and you put the other piece of tape on the other finger on your other hand. And if you just kind of move those fingers around, that piece of tape is going to have a kind of wave to it. It's going to, one end is stuck to one side and one end is stuck to the other. So wherever you move your two fingers, the other end will always be stationary, but the center is what twists, right? So it is the exact same thing with our abdomen muscles right here, right? Our abdomen muscles are going to twist and adjust. The top of our pectoral muscles is attached to our sternum of our rib cage. And the bottom of our abdomen muscles down here is attached to, I think it's the, oh no, it's not the front of the pelvis, but it does end around there. <laughs> kind of ends around where the pelvic region is, right? And those are our two attachment points. Um, our abdomen technically these these muscles ended like the the rib cage the front of the rib cage right here um but they do still twist they twist and they move right so we want to take that into account when we are illustrating this captain falcon here so with this front of the chest if i was to clean this up a little bit and the top apply it to the pose that we've got going on here you can really see how just intensely exaggerated this twist is just based on how I have to draw these abdomen muscles, right? It is an intense twist. It is an insane twist that they've got going on here um, with the whole body. Your serratus um, also touches your abdomen, if you didn't know that, uh, your abdomen muscles. So your serratus under here um, will attach to your other abdomen muscles like that. Very nice, very nice. Um, so yeah, just think of your think of your muscles because your muscles all have, oh gosh, it's um, it's insertion and oh, hang on, give me a second. Um, it's so insertion and origin. Muscles will always have an insertion and an origin, right? So it is where the muscle starts and where it ends. And their insertion and origins will always be on bones, right? So let me give you an example. If we have the, oh gosh, if we have the sternocleomastoid, um, if anybody wants to go E for me, if you feel that muscle flexing on your neck while you go E, that is your sternocleomastoid. That is a muscle that, where its origin point, oh God, where is the origin point? The origin point, 
Yes, okay, I was right. Oop. Hello? I'm so sorry. Something happened. <laughs> Can we hear me? Are we good? Is everything okay? I'm so sorry. I clicked something. I think I accidentally reloaded it. Okay. We're good? Still here? Okay, excellent. I was never off. Okay, uh, sorry. I think I accidentally reloaded the page, so I thought I was worried for a second. <laughs> so, right here is our clavicle and our the beginning of our sternum. It's like our... Um, yeah, the sternum and the clavicle. So our sternocleomastoid is... Its origin point starts right here. So it is our, again, our clavicle and our... Um, sternum, the center bone, and it goes up to the back here to our mastoid process. Our origin and our insertion. So where it starts and where it ends. Right, so similar to all of the rest of our muscles, we want to find that origin and insertion, and when we find that, we also know the function of the muscles that we are um, Oh my god. We, we know the function of the muscles that we are referring to, right? Nice and simple, nice and easy. Right? Pectoral muscles, right? I believe the origin is the sternum and then the insertion is the humerus. So it helps us push our arms forwards. So that's what our, that's what our uh, uh, pectoral muscles are for, right? But yes. So, always remember our origin and our insertion, and everything will work out just fine. Oh, I think I moved this. Oopsies. I think I moved everything. Oopsies. What did I do? Oh, yeah, it's like that. Okay, there we go. <laughs> I moved everything a little bit. Oopsie doopsie. Okay. I'm ending a little bit early on Marissa, though, because I think that's about as much as I can say about this one. Thank you so much for submitting, Marissa. Everybody say thank you. You did great. You're an amazing artist. Um, honestly, in terms of technical skill, you have very little to learn. Um, I would say that the thing that you probably want to focus on more now is style. Um, so make sure that you are really honing in on finding that voice. I mean, you've already got it. Um, but hone in on finding that voice, hone in on finding that artistic, um, visual, um, sort of thing that makes you unique, and you are good to go. So, thank you, Marissa, so much for submitting, um, and we will move on to the next artist. Uh, the next individual, <laughs> your name, uh, Het Nacho. Uh, I know that you're, it's, it's heterochromic nachos, um, but it's just... It makes me think of heterosexual nacho. I just, it's, that's real. Um, the Het Nacho, uh, she submitted her own work. Um, I love the place that you put your, your signature here. <laughs> it's really cute. Um, oh, did I draw that by accident? I may have. I'm not too sure. I'll, I'll, I'll get rid of that, just in case. Um, but Het Nacho, thank you so much for submitting um, your work. Oh, it's like, it's like dancing. Um, thank you so much for submitting your work for today. Um, let me flatten this really quickly. So then I can edit this. Again, another example of... Um, perhaps not somebody who's a beginner, but a very, very complicated pose. This is a very complicated pose. Um, the amount of foreshortening that you are doing here... Um, with a, a dynamic pose, no less. Incredibly complicated. Incredibly, incredibly complicated. And this, I, I applaud you for attempting it. Um, but again, it is complicated. It is a pose that takes a, a very, very heavy understanding of... Um, it takes it takes a very very heavy understanding of your anatomy and your forms in order to pull something like this off. I know exactly what you were trying to do, um, but it is complicated. You did get a little lost um, while you were doing this one, and that's completely fine. Um, it takes Jesse level anatomical foreshortening skill. I think it takes a bit higher than me, <laughs> a bit higher of an understanding than I have. Um, even I'm a little stiff to to do this one. Um, 
Yeah, please don't draw until your hands hurt. If your hands have started hurting, then that means you need to stop. Um, so let's analyze what this pose is. If you are struggling to kind of identify what's going on here, what's happening is this character is sort of leaning forward so their chest is parallel to the ground. Um, so you have a bit of an arc here, um, but your legs are still standing, sort of twisting like this, right? It's a very, very anime, very exaggerated pose. Um, this arm is kind of coming out, giving us a bit of a peace sign. And this arm is twisting back here to hold this, right? Is this pose impossible? No, actually. It is very, very possible, but you have to be incredibly flexible if you want to do something like this. Again, also very exaggerated, very, very anime-esque. Pose, right? Very, very anime as pose. So what would might be helpful is if I just go through how I would approach this all together, right? Does this have to do with anime? There's a lot of different, like, um, oh, how do I explain this? We have a lot of different, um, cultural norms when it comes to our art. Culture comes through in every artist's work um no matter whether you are focused no matter if you are focusing on um the actual culture that you are from or or not right you as an individual right if you are drawing in an anime style if you are drawing with very japanese sort of if you're drawing with like a, like anime and minor if you watch a lot of anime you are like in turn drawing with japanese culture right so they, this kind of pose, this kind of exaggeration, this kind of cutesy sort of look is very Japanese. It's a very Japanese way of working. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, it's just the culture that this comes from, right? You don't really see poses like this in Western work, I will say. Um, Western work is a lot more macho. It's a lot more, uh, a little more stiff, I would say, um, unless you go into like the Cartoon Network way of working. Um, but again, different cultural norms, different cultural poses, different ways that we as individuals are. Um, so no matter where you are from, no matter what you do, no matter what you illustrate, your culture comes through in the way that you draw. Uh, for instance, um, here's a fun fact for you. Did you know that, I believe this is correct, in Japan, sitting crisscross applesauce is actually considered very rude. So if you're a My Hero fan, uh, Bakugo sits crisscross applesauce all the time. And people are like, why does he sit like that? It's so cute. Because it's actually seen as delinquency. It's, it's a very, it's a different culture over there. It's a different cultural norm. So sitting like this, just kind of casually in a setting, is a little bit rude over there. Um, however, over here, it's sitting quite politely, right here over in the West. So it is a bit, it's a different culture. It's a different pose um, that means different things based on where you are, right? Culture is, culture is present in everything that we do. Uh, and it's, I think it's very fascinating. All right, so again, I figured what I could do for you is that we could go through this pose and I could really take you through how I would approach something this complicated. So first things first, again, I would draw the head um, because I am uh, an individual who loves drawing heads, <laughs> heads first, um, unless I am working in like gesture. Um, just to make it a little bit easier though, um, with the way that the neck is going to be craning, I'm probably going to want this face to be looking downwards, right? I'm going to draw this if, as if it's a person. I don't really know too much about TMNT, but they, I know that they are, they still do kind of go off of human anatomy, so I don't think it will be that different. Um, so I would have it so that their eyes... So that everything's just a little bit facing downwards so we've got a bit of that perspective going on like that this isn't great but <laughs> you know it is what it is I'm trying to be fast so we've got that head sort of angled downwards Right, bit of a bit of a seven eighth head so not totally from the front not totally three fourths so we might have a bit of the ear. Actually, no, we won't. The ear won't be poking out. Um, but the neck is going to be craning. And we do want to understand where that neck comes from. So we're going to still draw bits of it. A very advanced concept when it comes to drawing foreshortening. If you are an advanced artist, this will make sense. You want to stack shapes. Don't think of your forms anymore. You're stacking shapes. You're stacking silhouettes. Right? So we're going to be drawing this neck as if it is craning. For those of you who are a little bit less... 
um, in tune with foreshortening and more, less advanced, you're going to be thinking of this as if it's a cylinder that is coming off the back of the head, but only this much will be showing. You're still going to want to kind of draw a bit of that in there. Now, in order for this chest to be parallel to the ground, it is also going to be foreshortened. So we're only going to be drawing a the upper side of the rib cage here, right? Let's push that even higher. So we have more of the rib cage facing down to the ground. We have more of our back showing here. So again, looking at our rib cage from the top, you're probably only going to get about an oval going on in there, right? If you think about the center of the body, it's right here. And then same deal for the rest of the torso. It is stacked. We are still dealing with foreshortening. This is all completely foreshortened. But we still want to keep our spine in mind. Remember, our thoracic attached to our rib cage curves this way. Our lumbar, which is attached to nothing, curves this way. So we want to keep that S in mind. So if we want a nice fluid pose, even though we are foreshortened like this, we want that nice curve of the back there anyway. So maybe we have a bit of the stomach showing here. And it's going to be just a slight curve as we have a foreshortened, completely foreshortened upper torso. Very, very complicated. Extremely complicated. This is not the most, <laughs> this is not a simple pose in any regard. Another thing that is going to be foreshortened is our, um, oh my God, is our pelvis, our hips. We're gonna be seeing the top of our pelvis right here as it attaches to our torso. However, we're also gonna kinda see the front of it. It's more like our butt is gonna be right here. Um, it's like we have the rib cage here and we have our clavicles going right here. And then our spine does this. And it's almost like it bends still. Whoops. It bends still. And our pelvis is doing this. This is an incredibly, incredibly uh, exaggerated pose. And is it possible? Yeah, but probably not unless you're super, super flexible. So we have our pelvis kind of coming down here so that our legs have an attachment point. And we can have one leg here. And if we drew the entire pelvis like this, the other leg is going to come out over here. Again, even if you can't see it, you should still probably draw it. Because it will give you an idea of where everything is. And you wanted one leg kind of going out that way. So let's go with that. So we have our two thighs. And they're all kind of on the same. We want to make sure that they are still referentially measured. Remember, the other side of our pelvis is right here, so the rest of our thigh is behind the body. We can't see it, but we still want to draw it in to make sure that those measurements are correct. A lot of people call this the knee knocker pose. When you've got like your legs kind of like together like this and you do this, it's, it's again, it's kind of a Japanese pose. Um, Personally, I'm not a huge fan. I used to do it all the time and then now I'm like, ah, oh, it looks really unnatural. Um, but again, exaggerated, who cares? We're gonna have this calf going down this way. Again, I talked about it. Inner muscle lower, outer muscle higher. And then just be based on how this pose goes, you're probably gonna have this foot pointed. Like this. And just to make this pose a little bit better, because right now we've kind of got this leg going like this, and that's a bit freaky and a bit strange so you might actually want to make this leg um just a little bit foreshortened not super extreme but enough to where the foot is just a little bit higher like that If you ever struggle with drawing feet, another way that you can draw the bottom of the foot is with the figure eight. With the lopsided figure eight, big toe, four little ones. Ta-da! Nice and simple. You can also do that with drawing the perspective of the foot as well. ta 
Ta-da! This is another sort of advanced concept, but using a figure eight is also a really easy way to do different perspectives of the foot. It's Photoshop, my friend. If we want this hand to be giving us a peace sign, this whole torso is going to have to twist if we also want this hand back here holding that sign. So actually, we're going to twist this torso a little bit like this. And our shoulder is going to be right here. This is where things are going to get a little bit funky. So, bending our arm back this way, not going to work anymore. The most we're probably going to get is like this. So, what you're probably going to want to do instead... Actually, this might, cut, this might be kind of fun. Is if you give us a little peace sign like that instead. So now this arm is naturally reaching downwards and giving us this kind of point of extension. So then this arm in the back can reach back a little bit better. This is also going to be foreshortened. So this arm is going to be foreshortened just a little bit. And we can hold our staff like this. Unfortunately, there is no way for you to have this like reach all the way back here and it not look super painful like you totally could and it is really really exaggerated but in my humble opinion reaching back like this is going to look pretty crazy um and it is like you are in mid action unfortunately this one is a little bit uh, just a smidge more static um because it is a pose so instead of them like actually running or moving where you could get away with pushing that arm farther back, you might want to stick to just here. To which then, your shoulders are still in line with each other and it's not too bad. So again, if we kind of foreshorten our upper arm here. And add in our forearm. We can have this arm doing this magic. You can even have it so that the the paintbrush kind of does this, and that's also pretty cool. Is if it kind of crosses behind the body like this. Right, so we've still got this torso sort of facing the ground, but now what we've done is we've sort of made it so it doesn't feel a little bit too bendy. It still feels a little, this still feels plausible. Do you have any experience in animating and storyboarding, just out of curiosity? Storyboarding? Uh, okay, technically, yes, in both. <laughs> Technically, yes, in both. Um, very gay Marty in terms of both, and not that much experience. Um, but yes, I have gone to school for, for both. Um, don't let her lie to you. I'm very I'm very basic with those things. I don't know that much. Um, but yes, lots of foreshortening. This whole torso here, foreshortened, right? We are dealing with nothing but foreshortening here. A little bit of foreshortening on this back leg. A little bit of foreshortening on this forearm. Or, sorry, not forearm. Upper arm, right? Lots and lots of foreshortening going on. A bit, like, slight changes to the pose itself. Um, but I think that this kind of helps bring it um, to somewhere that's a little bit more realistic. Um, I personally like this kind of lower peace sign. <laughs> I think that's kind of fun. Um, giving us a bit of, like, a sassier um, peace sign by comparison to before. Um... We've got a bit of that C curve going on here, but it is a bit of a strange pose, so our movement is a bit uh, odd here. Um, if anything, if nothing, if something doesn't work immediately, you can always try again. No, that that takes our balance off. Yeah.
don't mind me, because I kind of work through this one. <laughs> Yeah, if anything, if the first try doesn't look that great, you can always do it again, right? Mess around with it, see what other people think, right? There's lots of different ways that you can work and move to get that sort of pose that you really want. Do I like turtles? Well, of course I like turtles. How often do you practice on anatomy drawing? Technically every day. <laughs> Art is my full-time job, so I am... Um, I work freelance um, and I do this for my job. So working at Wing Canvas is part of my full-time job. <laughs> um, both of my art jobs, like all of my art jobs work together to create a full-time job pretty much. Um, it's just he's still the speed demon I know. I'm, I'm like, I feel like I've gotten slower, but maybe it's just because I focus on more now. Um, what tips do you have on posing? The best poses will always be dynamic. The best poses will also have some kind of foreshortening. Um, it is rare that you will get a really good dynamic pose that does not have at least a little bit of foreshortening, right? So even if you have like, like if you have a running pose, right, a really nice, let's say like you're doing a bit of a goofier kind of running pose, head up, chest forward kind of running pose. So if we've got one arm back sort of here. If we have this arm up here, our forearm is going to be foreshortened. Right? Even if it's perfectly from the side, this forearm, foreshortened. Right? And then we've got our our legs doing doing this kind of magic. But yeah, the best poses are going to be have are, are going to have some kind of foreshortening, unfortunately, for people who don't like foreshortening. <laughs> I love foreshortening. Um, any tips for drawing faster? My personal favorite thing that I loved to do when I was in high school was I took a lot of public transit and the thing that I would do is I would pull out my sketchbook, like a physical sketchbook, and I would use tools that were unable to erase and draw the people on the bus. Now, why don't I want my tool to erase? I would use pen, I would use brush pen, I would use brush marker, stuff like that. Um, and I don't want to erase because I want to get it all done on the first try. The thing that everybody, like the number one thing that slows people down is using an eraser. And if you lose your reliance on the eraser, you get so much faster is number one. Number two, I do it on a bus because a bus is shaky. <laughs> it helps us keep that. It, like even if you didn't do it on purpose, that bus is gonna shake, it is gonna mess up your lines. But this will also get us A, to get stuff right on the first try, B, make our hands more loose, make us quicker, and C, also get us gets us to deal with our mistakes. Sometimes we just need to let go. <laughs> no, no use in being a perfectionist. Let go, go like, okay, I'm good. No need to, to waste time on this, move on. Why would I draw the people on the bus? Because I don't know how long they're going to be there for. They're also not technically a model. They are a person. And they could leave in the next 30 seconds. They could leave in the next 30 minutes. They might just move in their chair. They're not going to be stuck there forever, right? So we need to draw them as quickly as possible. We're drawing the person as quickly as possible, unable to use an eraser, and we have to deal with our mistakes that are going that it cannot be erased and the more that you do this the better you get at doing everything on the first try right really great the way to do it if you want to get rid of the bus um kind of thing if you don't have a bus near you uh, you could do it in the car you could do it at a park if you if you want to be stationary maybe you get motion sick do it at a park instead drop like soccer draw like players of like games drop people in the park People that are moving is always a really good way of getting better, getting faster. But use a pen. Use a pen, use a brush marker. It did help a lot, yeah. Do you use a tablet that connects to a computer or one that you just draw directly on the screen? Uh, yes. <laughs> My tablet, uh, I have a Cintiq 13. Um, it is technically a Wacom hybrid. Uh, if you look up, if you do like um, ex exclamation point device Jesse or something, it'll give you my full list of what I'm using. Um, but yes, it is a tablet with a screen on it that connects directly to my PC. Oh yeah, there it is. Cinti Companion Hybrid 13 tablet and a custom built PC. Yeah, so my tablet connects directly to my PC, um, but it does have a screen on it. Yes. The 
to be a video on how to draw harpies soon? I don't think so. I mean, like, it's 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 such a it's such a topic that's like, like if you just kind of blend, like we've done anatomy videos on birds and we've done anatomy videos on people, and harpies are basically just the mix of the two. If you kind of get the, if you understand both, you can draw a harpy. What in your opinion is the best way to learn anatomy? Draw. That's literally it. Just draw. <laughs> but all right. Um, thank you so much, Het Nacho, for submitting. Hopefully this was a little bit more helpful. Um, hopefully this was a little bit helpful, uh, just kind of showing you how um, I would work through this pose um, and understanding each step of the way, um, just to kind of give me a good idea of where different things go. All right. Next individual that we are going to be going over is Sunny. Sunny, he submitted his work. He is P. Dragonjun. P. Dragonjun42 on Twitter. Um, specifically, I think Sunny asked for like help on anthro characters in general. Um, Sunny also seems like he is the type of person who would work with um, oh, what do you call it? Who draws in that full pose. Um, and not only does he draw in that full pose, he works very very slow and does the it does a very very clean version oh whoopsies does a very clean version of the pose and the anatomy underneath first oh everybody say thank you to sunny everybody say thank you everybody um give sunny a round of applause even if or sorry not sunny uh well yes sunny as well but uh uh hey, nacho give hey, nacho a round of applause uh, for being very brave submitting their work and letting me credit on stream um <laughs> yes, say everybody say thank you to Head Nacho, tell them they did great. Um, just keep going. Um, really practice without anatomy, really practice with focusing on what you want to achieve within your work, and you will get better, like way better in no time. All right. But yes, Sunny seems like the individual. I used to do this a lot too, where you start out with a really, really clean version of your under sketch, and then you're like, okay, well, I don't really want to ruin it, so I'm just gonna like draw directly on top of what I've drawn, right? Really hurtful in the long run, right? When we are illustrating characters, when we are illustrating people, our under sketch should not be, never be the cleanest thing that we draw, right? Um, I am the type of person who just draws straight ahead now. Like the amount of like things that I draw, I don't really give myself a diagram that frequently anymore. I kind of just go straight ahead, especially with characters that I'm like really used to. I just kind of go straight ahead and draw everything where I know it's supposed to go, right? But this is not something that you want to do immediately. This is something that you want to get to build up being able to do, not something that will come to you in an instant, right? Even this is kind of kind of sucks, but <laughs> but that's kind of just how I draw nowadays. Um, but another thing that is kind of a killer for your work is um, sticking too closely to what you've drawn for your undersketch. Right, and I think that that's definitely what's going on with these legs here. Um, I feel like you got really proud of drawing these legs and you're like, I don't want to get rid of the legs. And then you just kind of put pockets on top of them. Uh, I can definitely tell because you didn't cut off the pants anywhere. <laughs> um, but when we are drawing legs, you're sort of missing your pelvis here because it is a straight sort of that there sort of bend when we are drawing our legs we want to make sure that we are considering that sort of underwear like shape our pelvis and our legs will slot right in there we might not have a like thigh gap per se but there will absolutely be a bit of a notch there no matter what it will never be just a straight v there will always be a bit of pelvis showing off there Have we done a video on clothing? I'm pretty sure. So we always want to make sure that we are including our pelvis within our illustrations. 
right? Never want to forget those. A lot of my students forget their pelvis. It's like, it's like a thing that I think a lot of just younger artists or artists who are perhaps not as experienced will forget. I mean, that's completely fine. Give me a second. My voice is starting to hurt. Let's grab a, let's grab a halt. <laughs> Cause I am, my voice is starting to go a little bit. Uh, don't mind me getting my, my medicinal candy. I think the hydration check, I have a two liter bottle of water that I've been sipping from this entire time. I'm just, I've been talking since like 9 a.m. straight and I am, <laughs> my voice hurts. Um, thank you, Banana Juice. It's more than just me, but I hope you appreciate everyone's style. Let's say, I think the, the biggest thing that I am a little bit confused about mostly is just the po the choice of pose. Um, it's a very casual, just kind of standing pose, but there, and I'm not quite sure what's happening here. I think summoning in a gun or something. Um, I would expect more of an action pose if that was going to be happening. Um, but uh, let me just do this magic. If I flip the canvas here, notice how this pose is a little bit unbalanced. Everything is sort of leading to the side here. Um, and that happens especially when you are a specific handedness. <laughs> um, for me, my illustrations always tend to sort of lean uh, lean to the right as well. Um, just in terms of like my anatomy because I am right handed. Um, but we always want to kind of keep in mind our center of balance. And what we can do is track that with our, um, what do you call it? Track that with our, our line of action, right? If you've kind of got your character going on here, right? Think if we wanna sort of do, do this, right? Maybe we've got, or maybe we've got a, let's actually not start with that. Let's start with the angle of the, shoulders and angle of the hips, right? We want that sort of triangle movement going on. So if we've got a hand on the hip, on this side, then we're gonna sort of angle it like this. And then we can have our line of action going in there. So we've got our rib cage, and our pelvis like this. This is a bit exaggerated, but you know, that's fine. So we can have one leg up, another one like this, and then we can have our hand in the pocket like that. So this way we've got a bit of a more balanced sort of feeling to the pose instead of everything leading to one side, right? Generally, we want the angle of our shoulders and the angle of our hips to be on op opposition to each other. Oh, what's that called? It's, um, it starts with an S, I think. Uh, uh, does someone want to tell me <laughs> if they remember? Um, it's the opposing, like, if we want them to be on contrapposto. It's called contrapposto. It's sort of with a C, my bad. Um, <laughs> contrapposto, yes. If we have contrapposto, um, that is when these two, when our body has opposing sort of energies, opposing sort of angles to them. So, a contrapposto is really important when we have um, more balanced, more dynamic poses um, within an individual. So that was the main thing with the pose that I would like to point out. Another thing that I would like to point out, and another thing that you were kind of like, I'd like some, I think they wanted said they wanted tips on anthro characters. Um, not a problem. I think my main thing that I'm looking at down here is the legs. Now legs on anthro characters um, will probably be working with animal anatomy by comparison to human anatomy. Now I think this is like a dragony character. Now uh, dragons regardless, um, um, tend to take inspiration from dinosaurs, which tend to take inspiration, which tend to lean towards bird anatomy. So if we're thinking about bird legs, bird legs, birds are digitigrades, just like cats, dogs, stuff like that. And if you don't know what a digitigrade is, we have streams on that topic, but a digitigrade, um, creature is just a creature that walks on their digits. So they walk on their toes, 
right? If you've ever walked on your tippy toes before, that is pretty much how cats and dogs walk all the time. The only difference is that their bones have shifted. So the, um, uh, the carpals of the foot, oh, I forget they're, what they're called, but like, because we have the carpals of the hand, which is the palm, um, right? Metacarp oh no, the metacarpals, my bad, right? Metacarpals? Metacarp yes, so the metacarpals, the metacarpals of the foot, um, they just kind of get pushed back by comparison to us who have them just on our feet. We are plantigrades. Our metacarpals are planted on the ground. We are plantigrades. By comparison to digitigrades, which have their phalanges on the ground, metacarpals up top. So, with a dragon, we are going to have this kind of thing going on, right? Because we're going with bird legs. And we're going to want to kind of shift these measurements a little bit. to sort of give us a bit of a different feeling. Now, of course, you can kind of change the proportions as much as you want. Change the proportions, change the look, whatever your desire, hopes or desires are, right? But this right here is our knee. This right here is the heel, if you want to kind of give us that reference, right? If you want to kind of refer back to just like a person, right? Because we all have the same amount of joints in our legs, um, all of us vertebrae. We all have the same amount of joints in our legs. The biggest difference is just where the bones are placed. Right? So our knee, our heel are kind of placed in different places. living things see in FPS. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's true. We we do see in frames per second. What our brain does is like we the brain captures images and our, our or the eyes capture images and our brain just puts them together so fast that everything just looks like it's moving. Um frames per second is just like our measurement tool for it. Um but yes, we only see in about 30 to 60 frames per second. Um so we see things. So really, I have no clue why we need anything higher than 60 FPS because it's not like we can comprehend it anyway. But yes, so we want to keep this in mind when we are drawing anthro characters. Um, generally, the rest is fine, right? <laughs> we don't need to worry about that. Um, but a big thing is the size of these feet. Now, when we are drawing an individual, a big thing when we are coming up with the anatomy of a fantastical creature that is not, you know, us, is we need to figure out how they're going to balance on what it is that they're standing on, right? If you want very alien-like designs, right, you'll see a lot of aliens that are kind of built like, they're very, very large like this, and then their legs sort of do this thing right and this is very very alien to us because realistically nobody can balance on this right this feels very very strange and it's the same thing when it comes to fantastical creatures and animals and whatever right if you ever look at a bird i don't know what bird this is gonna be but if you ever think of like a bird birds have very very thin legs right but they've got really really wide feet wide and fairly large feet, right? And this helps them balance. It is a stable surface for them to stand on, right? And it's the same thing with somebody like this. If you are going to have somebody who is more anthropomorphic or somebody with, you know, anthro feet or anthro digits or whatever, you're going to need to make sure that they can stand on whatever it is that they are standing on. Right? So doing these tiny little paws doesn't really make sense. We want to make them a bit bigger so that they can hold their own while standing. But then you ask me, Jesse, why are cat paws so small? 
Why are dog pods so small by comparison to the entire body? Because they are quadrupeds. There's a reason why quadrupeds cannot really stand on their hind legs for very long. It's because their body weight cannot take all that pressure. Think of a horse. Horse hooves are pretty big, but compare, by comparison to the horse itself, they're quite small. Right? So they need four, to st four legs on the ground to stand stably. To stand, like, stable. Right? And it's the same thing with, like, cows and deer and stuff like that. They are large creatures, but they have very, very small feet. However, they are quadrupeds. So those four feet on the ground create a more stable footing for them. We are digitigrade. Uh, sorry, not digitigrade. We are um, bipeds. We are bipeds, not quadrupeds. So we need a more stable ground to stand on because we've only got two points of stabilization by comparison to quadrupeds that have four right so why a centipede needs a hundred legs no but it's why the hundred legs of centipedes are so thin so think about think about your balance think about your weighting Think about your waiting when it comes to illustrating anything. You're waiting how they're gonna stand, that how that sort of balance works with your character, right? Because drawing these super, super tiny paws does not work on a bipedal creature. Um, of course, it's fantasy, whatever, but it does help with the realism of the entire piece. I think my last little note here would be that this neck is far too wide if we are measuring it in reference to the rest of the torso. So let's say we've got our neck here. If we want our neck to feel a little bit more grounded, we can do this. Right, so this gives us a bit more of a more realistic feel when it comes to attaching a longer neck to a body. If you want a sort of vibe of what that looks like, let me pull out some Dragonborn that I've designed before. Uh -huh. Let's do a couple versions. So, right, so we've still got that sort of neck base going on here. It's not super wide, even though the neck is long, it still has a sort of humanoid-esque way that the neck lies on top of the full body. All right, so we've still got, got that kind of approach, even longer still. We've still got that same sort of base structure where a neck would attach to an upper torso, right? So, I want to make sure that that, that neck anatomy um, is still kept in mind, no matter how long the neck you get. No matter how long you decide to make that neck. <laughs> what do I draw in my free time? You can just call me Jesse, because um, we are a collective. Um, what leg classification would most arthropods be? See, that's a good question. I'm not sure. I feel like they're they're just kind of in a classification of their own. Um, I draw a lot of I draw a lot of D and D things. <laughs> I'm a, I'm a D and D nerd. Um, so whether it's like my own like campaign or uh, the campaign that I'm playing in, either of them, or if it's just kind of like my friends' characters or whatever, it's I like drawing D and D things. Um, I like drawing um. That's so cheesy. I like drawing my partner. I like drawing Pokemon. <laughs> I like drawing video game stuff. When I get into D&D, &D, grab a group of friends. Or watch somebody else play. Okay. Oh, that was a little bit of a spoiler. But alright. Sunny, thank you so much for submitting. Everybody sell. I gotta tell no offense. No, it's true. I mean, I literally just pulled out Dragonborn that I draw. Um... But thank you all so much. Thank you. Sorry, not. Well, but this isn't the end. Thank you, Sunny, <laughs> so much for submitting. Everybody say thank you. Um, everybody say thank you, Sunny. Thank you for submitting. Thank you for being brave and submitting your work today. Um, I hope this was helpful in any way. All right. Would Fussai still be affected if the creature hangs from the walls or ceilings? Yes. Because that is still a point of articulation and it is still a point of weight distribution. Alright, 
So the last one is by My Heart. My Heart was fascinating because they submitted a bunch of comics, uh, despite this being a an anatomy stream. Um, that did not stop me though. I was like, oh, you want me to crit comics? Yeah, I can do that. <laughs> um, I'll crit both though. I've got about 20 minutes, I can do both. Because you've kind of got the same repeated mistakes going on here over and over. Um, with both your comic work and the anatomy that's going on. A chunky for comic critting. I love comics. Um, comic work is one of my favorite things to do. Um, even though I don't do it too frequently anymore. I say as I drew a comic like two days ago. Um, number one thing that I'll say immediately, right, is that your poses are very, very stiff. They're super, super stiff. Right? I can tell you kind of don't really like drawing things from three fourth. I can tell that you're really not comfortable with those angles you can do. You can do full straight ahead for bodies. You can do side generally for bodies, but you're not too great with three fourth for the body. Um, and it seems you're really only kind of comfortable with three fourth for the head. Now, comic work uh, takes you being good with everything. <laughs> um, comic work in 10, like, makes you be good at absolutely everything right and i think my biggest point um when it comes to drawing people for comics is to i think the number one thing you really need to hone in on is just drawing the body um because just looking at these people you are missing a lot of different um you're missing a lot of different muscles. You're missing a lot of different anatomical things within each of these bodies. If I break down this one, for instance, your shoulder is missing here. You've got your trapezius, but you're missing your deltoid. So don't forget to bring that up through there. Right, because your deltoid is kind of missing there. This arm is foreshortened. But you've kind of lost your elbow in there. The hand is generally fine, but we can do this for the fingers instead. Because they will sort of do that magic. And again, you're posing. Your posing is not quite dynamic enough. This is very, very vertical, right? You have just the slightest bit of diagonal going on here. But if you really wanted a fight to break out, right? If I just kind of trace what you've got going on here... I kind of just trace what's going on here. It kind of just feels like this person is standing, right? They're maybe about to fly up. They might be about to just kind of rise up a little bit, right? They're not really rushing into battle for action, right? Lean them forward. Crane that neck upwards. Push that arm. Get that arch of the back in there. Opposing leg forward, other one backwards. Right, you could even have this hand coming up here like that, right? Like they're about to rush forwards like that, right? Feel the angle, feel the movement that goes through this pose, right? And that movement is super important when it comes to comic work because you are trying to you are trying to create a moving image without anything moving. You are creating action without animation, right? And you as an artist, you as a comic artist need to kind of show um, movement in a way where um, it is implied, but nothing is moving, right? Let me give you an example. I drew this for fun a couple days ago, right? You can kind of tell that everything is moving this way. Why? Because the hair is whipping this way. There's action lines moving this way. 
right? The beard is moving this way, right? The hand is turning this way. There is so much movement in this piece, even though they're sitting in a car, right? And it kind of gives you that feeling of moving, that feeling of movement. And you need to sort of understand how these things are moving without actually having them move, right? And comic work is like, you need to be really, really good at movement in your poses if you want to um, create that sense of movement without animation being there, right? So really, really think about how you're moving. This pose, I'm not too sure what's going on here, unfortunately. And you do have this arm covering the face. And I can tell that you really didn't want to cover up the entire face um, because you have a little bit of it still coming through here. And this eye is pretty out of line with the rest of the face if we draw that out here, right? Again, just like with the previous ones, if we are to draw the entire diagram for the face out, right? Like that. The eye is right here, right? And we want to make sure that we are drawing um, television women. Hi, Kay. We want to make sure that we are drawing the entire figure before um, we do any sort of cleanup because this way, this is how we keep things proportionate. Another thing, look at how tiny her head is compared to his in this in this panel. And look at how tiny that difference is. I just taught my mentorship students about this. We want to think about proportion, right? Proportion is how we reference Relative proportion is how we measure out everything in a scene, right? It's how we make sure that everything feels like it's grounded, like it is realistic. By realistic, I do not mean that it is realism that we are illustrating from, but that it is, um, it still feels like, like accurate <laughs> in a way. Uh, an example I gave to my students was like, you know how big a fork is. If you hold a fork in your hand, you know how big it's supposed to look. You know how big a person is supposed to look in a bathtub. You know how big a car is supposed to look next to a person. You know how big a person should be when standing in a doorway, right? Maybe you don't know the exact measurements. A doorway is six foot six average, by the way. But if you have a, you don't know exactly how big they are, right? But you have a general idea in your brain of how big they should look, right? Look how large her head is here, right? If we took this entire measurement of the head, look at how large her head is compared to his, right? It is quite big because if we continued with hair, it is way bigger than his, his head is, right? Doesn't make a lot of sense. We need to make sure that we are proportioning out our illustrations so that they make more sense, right? Again, look how tiny she is compared to him. Okay, what else do I want to say? Um, in terms of anatomy... Hands, when we draw our hands, look at how teeny, teeny, tiny these hands are. Um, I'm not here to smack your hand against your face, but put your hand on your face for me. If you feel that, you notice how your hand is approximately the same size as your face. Right? Look at how teeny tiny this hand is compared to her face. Itty bitty bitty. Even his face. Itty bitty tiny. Right? These hands need to be much, much larger. Way larger. Right? So if we were to draw a hand that was approximately the size of his face, that's how big your hands should be. Approximately. Right? Much, much larger. Right? We want to make sure that our hands are the correct size as well. And another thing. You kind of draw all of your limbs a little bit like sticks. You're missing a bit of that muscle definition. And you're also missing a bit, again, of that muscle serration that happens when it comes to moving a body. This are, this torso I'm seeing especially, you definitely drew out your trapezoid here, saw two circles for shoulders, and then drew out your arms like that, right? Not super, not super bad, but... The face is three-fourths, so I expect the torso to also be three-fourths, which means our shoulder is going to be brought a little bit farther forward like this. The 
other one is a little bit farther back. We're also reaching forwards. Again, action. Right now, it kind of does just feel like these two people have their arms at their sides and they're like, oh no. <laughs> right? They're not really reaching. There's a difference between having two people kind of just standing there... like this right going like oh I'm fighting you it's like ah these are terrible diagrams but you know what I mean because they're kind of just standing there like smacking each other like this if you wanted it to really look like a cat fight again exaggerate those poses make those poses more interesting like maybe we've got this person lunging forward They've got this arm kind of reeling back here. Like they're about to punch you. And this arm is like grabbing hair or something. Foreshortened here, raised up. We've got this person here. Make them at a side angle. And maybe they're also reaching and clawing at hair yanking hair from the head like this right straight arms that it is a strong strong pulling movement right maybe they've got one arm kind of reeling back here as well right there's a difference in movement, right? You want to feel that energy. You want to feel that action happening, right? You want to be able to kind of feel that, like, energy of fighting. You want to feel that energy of being a crow, true. <laughs> you want to feel that energy of, like, somebody, like, fighting with somebody. Somebody, like, at opposition, right? In terms of comics less so posing, less so anatomy. In terms of comics, if you have to put numbers on your panels, then your comic is not clear enough. I'll put that there right now, right? Because I would not have read this one, two, three, four, five. That is not how I would have read this at all. I would have read this one, two, three, four, maybe this one, then maybe this one, going to this one and this one, right? Your comics, your panels, your panel layouts, again, just like movement, should flow into one another, right? If you've got the two panel thing going on, they should not exceed the width of the next panel so that we know to go like this and then that. And then we go back down here and maybe we have another panel here, another one here, right? We never want to exceed that. Roast mode, no. I'm not in roast mode. This is just how I talk with my students. We never want to exceed that width. We want to make sure that this panel flow feels really, really natural, right? Let me pull out some camp panels that I've done. Um... Okay. Right, so even in more experimental paneling, right, we can tell that this is the first panel here. You go down, and then this is the next one, then this one, then this one, then this one. We go down. One, two, three. You don't need numbers to tell me that. I didn't need numbers to tell you that. People know that, right? It's a very clear way of reading because we read left to right, right? Over here in the West, we read left to right. So just keeping that flow of paneling up, really, really important. Same thing with this one, even though this is diagonal, right? One, two, three. And then we have one straight ahead here. And then going from left to right, top left to bottom right, we go, okay, this one first, then this one, then this one, right? Nobody does this because we're going backwards if we go back to this panel. So it makes more sense to go in this direction. Gorgeous panels, thank you. 
right? And then on this one again, big long panel. And the same left to right. It all flows like this, right? It's that top left to bottom right, right? Because of how we read a page. Nice and easy to go through. This was a, these were camp pages because um, I teach comics and manga during the summer. Um, so for a whole week, uh, I drew, uh, it was six pages, I think, six or seven. Um, but yeah. Right, so we want to make sure that we have that flow of the panels and we understand where things go. You can get more creative with it, but the second that you lose people and you have to put numbers on, you've lost this. Like, it's it's not enough, right? Because, again, this gets confusing because this strip kind of closes off here and goes between this one, right? It's counterintuitive to go backwards to read because we want to keep up that left to right feeling right because we're going down here then we go left to right here but then we go right to left so it creates a sort of disruption in our flow of movement um another thing when i tell my students it's you want to make sure that you are creating enough context for what it is that you're illustrating right all I see here is two eyes, and then they're about to fight. Five minutes of fighting later, why are they fighting? We have no clue. And then a person comes here, and she's eating a cookie, and then they're crying. I don't get it. <laughs> right? What you probably should have had is one panel of these two. The two eyes looking at each other. All right? How I personally would have laid this out. If we have... Two panels of eyes looking at each other. One full panel of a last cookie on a plate. Right? So that gives it visual importance. And then you have maybe two to three panels here of them like rolling up sleeves. They're preparing. They're like, okay, I'm ready to fight. And then you have a full panel here of them lunging at each other like prepping to fight and then you have another full panel here you don't need an entire panel to say five minutes of fighting later you just need a little bar up here it's like five minutes and then maybe they're still just kind of like cat fighting if you wanted just the kind of like lazy looking cat fighting maybe they have like the cat fighting going on like that and then you have a panel of them just kind of small here and they're like fighting and then the crunch crunch and then they both turn to look over and then there's that extra person eating the cookie here and it's nice and big so you know it's important And then you have the two of them, like, upset here. And this feels like a stronger flow of movement. It gives us enough context. It gives us enough padding. Um, it gives us enough, uh, what do you call it, tension, right? When you are building, when you are writing a comic, you want to build up tension within your movement. You want to build up tension within your actions, right? your main subject so we have enough context here so we have two people they're clearly angry they're angry about something like oh my god what are they angry about answer the question right here cookie right what are they gonna do about it they start to prep and then they fight right cut that off five minutes later they're kind of like this they're kind of weakly fighting each other maybe still fighting but a little bit smaller now because it's a little less important they hear the crunch crunch and then an action happens where they look over and then it's an important panel where you see an answer to this question. What's going on? This is the answer to the question. She's eating the cookie. And then they're like, oh. <laughs> and that's your reaction going on there. Right? Stronger flow. A stronger feel of how these panels move. Where the actions should go. Stuff like that. Right? Because we have no context for why they're fighting to begin with here. So then that makes us a little bit confused going forward. They're just fighting. Why? We don't know. Right? And then a person standing here eating a cookie. Why? We don't know. 
right? We have no context for any of this that's going on here. So make sure that we have context in the beginning, then we can add some padding and we can add some other maybe um, visual effects, not necessarily like illustrative, but like other scenes, other actions, other insert shots, stuff like that, in order to give us a bit of like that build up to the main action that is happening within the comic. Learn cell shading, step to cell shading, and comic effects. You don't need to do that. No. Not all comics have to look the same. I personally, I used to do my comics in a sort of mix of cell and soft. Um, and then me personally, nowadays, I tend to do like no like shading at all. <laughs> I think it's actually quite fun. Um, I think it is more important to figure out what you want rather than look at other people and go, oh, this is what they do. This is what I should do. Um, so I think it's important to find your own voice with that. Um, but all right, everybody, give every, give my heart a nice, oh, my heart official, my heart underscore official, not too sure where, um, but everybody give my heart a nice, um, <laughs> A nice round of applause. Thank you so much for submitting. Um, thank you for sharing. We appreciate you um, and well done. Just get, get used to doing that flow, get used to drawing more proper anatomy um, and well done for everyone. Um, but yes, that is five o'clock. Thank you all so, so much for joining. Um, Thank you all for submitting, even if you were not chosen today. Um, I appreciate you all submitting regardless. Um, and to those of you who were, who had submitted today. Um, so that is, let me open up all these files once again. That is Amber, a Clover, Het Nacho, Marissa, My Heart, and Sunny. If any of you, any of you lovely artists who were in stream today, if any of you would like your working files, feel free to contact me directly. I will love, I will absolutely give you your working files um, that you can sift through if you would like. Um, and if you would like some extra clarification, my DMs are open as well. So. Um, if you were an artist on here, feel free to DM me, feel free to reach out to me um, via the Discord, um, however you wish, um, and I will absolutely gladly give you your working file from today. Um, but yes, um, thank you all so much for joining. If you don't know too much about the studio, don't know too much about us, um, some of you have been calling me Canvas. I'm not the only Wing Canvas person. I am part of a collective, WingCanvas.com. We are an art school. If you'd like to check out the classes that we offer, um, I teach both um, art mentorship, um, which is very portfolio based. And I also teach uh, digital art level two, um, which is a slightly more advanced version of um, digital art classes. So if you would like to check those out, feel free to do so in canvas.com. I believe we have uh, winter camps coming up. So if you'd like to check those out too, um, feel free to do so. Um, if you would like access to any of the files that we do that are, you know, more illustrative based, not necessarily crit based, um, you can join us over at Discord. Um, and I, along with the other instructors, always upload our JPEGs over there. Um, so you can take a look and download them, do whatever you would like with them um, for future reference to whatever you would like to do. But if you would like working files, you're gonna have to join our Patreon. Um, you can join our Patreon and become a member. Uh, discounted classes, class recordings, um, working files from streams, so on and so forth. Um, and you are able to take a look at those um along with a lot of bonus content um on there next week what you guys are going to be doing you are with josh but this sunday you are with iggy um but uh, this sunday you're with iggy how to draw submarines how to draw submarines goodness um you'll be with iggy And then on the 25th, you will be with Josh, who will be fixing your animations. Where I did anatomy, you will, he will be fixing your animations. And then you will be with Iggy once again, doing cozy outfit design on the Sunday. But all right, thank you all so, so much for joining and I'll see y'all in a couple weeks. Au revoir, bye-bye.